Most High be praised. Thank the Almighty for another class session. Trust that each one of you have had a blessed week. I want to say shalom to those of you who are joining us by live stream. Welcome to our Hebrew One class. Now today, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about verbs and nouns. This would be part two on verbs and nouns because we've already covered verbs and nouns, but there's some more information that we need to go over in this section. And uh, before we get started, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you once again for your goodness, your kindness, and your graciousness. We praise you for your mercies. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able to learn the language of the ancients of our Hebrew Israelite culture. We trust that all of your disciples, your Talmudim, those who have enrolled and those who are joining us in this teaching session, we ask that you would touch their hearts and their minds, give them a desire for learning, give them an openness for wanting to understand Hebrew and recognize its great significance in understanding the scriptures and also understanding the way in which you revealed yourself to us in language. We thank you. We ask that you would be glorified in everything that's done yes. and bringing edification and helping us to be equipped in Yahshua's great name. Amen. Now today as we look at nouns and verbs, or shall I say verbs and nouns, I want to reiterate some things with respect to the language. As we know in Hebrew, it is an action language, so we need to always remember that the nouns in Hebrew are also verbs as well because the language of Hebrew is always moving, it's dynamic, it's not static, which is different in, uh, in English. We see differences there with nouns and verbs. And one of the ways in which we recognize a verb in English is that a verb is an action word, whereas in Hebrew, our nouns and our verbs are both action, so that's a little different. Um, the last lesson we had on verbs and nouns, we talked about the various tenses in the verbs and uh, the tenses that we dealt with was perfect, imperfect, participle, and imperative. Those were the tenses that we dealt with and we described what those tenses were. We um, talked about how that each root represents an action, this is in a verb, and that the abstract idea from a root is where we get our noun from in Hebrew. So we, we talked about that. We used um, a word such as Barak, which means to kneel, 
that's an action. Um, and we also looked at that same word, Barak, which is the bait, the resh, and the cough. And the same word as a noun is berek, and that word is a knee. A knee is a thing on a part of the body. So we have the same word of the same root, barek or barak. And it is both a verb and a noun. So those are some of the things that we had talked about in our last session as we dealt with the roots. And we looked at that on uh, page 37 in the ancient Hebrew lexicon. Now, as we continue, we want to look at another aspect of the verb, which has to do with voice. So when we're dealing with uh, the verbs, each verb also includes the voice of which there are three. There's active voice, there's passive voice, then there's reflexive voice. So the active voice, with respect to the verb, identifies the action of the verb as coming from the subject. Now, when we look at this here, we're going to deal with the word that we dealt with before, which meant to cut. And when we look at it in the active voice, the word cut is used to mean he cut. So when we look at that expression he cut, what it's doing, it's showing us the verb being associated with the subject, such as he cut. So who's doing the cutting? He is. So this is an example of the active voice with respect to the verb. Now, the passive voice, it doesn't identify the origin of action placed on the subject of the verb. So if we were to use the same word that means to cut, and it was put in the passive voice, it would be expressed as he was cut. Now, he was cut is an expression of what happened to the person. It's not in direct association with the person such as he cut, who is doing the cutting, but he was cut is telling us what happened to the subject. So in this case, this is how we use passive voice. Now, reflexive. Because this is the third aspect of voice used for verbs. The reflexive voice places the action of the verb onto the subject. So in this case, where we're using the word to cut, it would be expressed as he cut himself. So with reflexive voice, we see the action of the verb being put on the subject. He cut himself. So we see the action. The action is the cut. That's the action. And the cut is placed upon himself in this instance. So here's how we look at the ways in which voice is used in the Hebrew. There again, we have active voice, we have passive voice, and we have reflexive voice. 
These are the three different types of voices that are used with respect to verbs. Now what we want to do, we want to look at the mood. Mood. So we want to note that each verb also includes mood. And in this case, there are three. There's simple, there's intensive, and there is causative. Now, the simple mood is simple action of the verb. And in the simple sense, it would just be, he cut, okay? The intensive mood, however, it implies force or emphasis on the verb. In this case, you can have a word that describes a cutting, but it gives a more intense idea when it's expressed. So instead of saying he cut, we would say he slashed or he hacked. When we hear those terms, we get a more intensified action. I mean, it's one thing to say he cut, but to say he hacked, you know, that's, that's, that's saying, you know, okay, it's like somebody, difference between someone having a steak, not cutting a steak, and somebody having a machete, you know, and cutting down uh, a limb of something, you know what I mean? So there's a different mood that you get by the use of these words. And, and there again, the word slashed or hacked, those are English words that mean the same thing as cut. It just gives a more intensified mood or a more intensified feeling with respect to the word cut. You know, cut is just one of the many terms used in the English language to refer to something being cut or torn, okay? Um, now, as far as the third mood that's uh, noted here, the causative mood, it expresses causation to the verb. And this would be expressed by the phrase, he caused or, yeah, he caused a cut. So in that instance, um, it has to do with expressing something that was done. Another way of saying it is, he made cut, or he made a cut. That's another way of expressing mood in the causative. So we have here these three types of moods, the simple, the emphasis on the intense, and also the causative. The simple, the intensive, and the causative. Now with all of these, you can have a mood where it is simple and active. You can have a mood where um, it has a voice that would be simple, simple mood, passive voice. You also have an intensive mood and an active voice and a causative mood and an active voice. Also, you can have a a causative mood and a passive voice, and you can have an intensive mood with a reflexive voice. Let me give you some examples of how those all work together. For example, um, and, and we've already looked at uh, the simple and the uh, active with reference to mood and voice for um, to cut, but we want to see how it's expressed. So you're going to hear some of the same expressions being given here.
but we're going to see it as it's understood by combining the mood and the voice. All right? So for the simple mood with the active voice, it's just simply he cut. And if it is the simple mood with the passive voice, it would be he was cut. Okay? That would be simple mood, passive voice. Now, the mood is intensive and active. It would be he slashed. That's intensive and active. That word slash is intensive because it gives a more intensive feeling and mood to the word to cut, but it's active in that we see the word now being referred with respect to the subject. So he slash. It refers to the person doing the slashing, not the person being slashed. So in that instance, it's intensive and active. Uh, now we want to look at the intensive mood and the passive voice. In this instance, when we look at passive, another thing I want to know uh, and to say about the passive voice is that uh, to best understand it, passive voice has to do with that that has already occurred. So we will say he was slash, just as when we use the passive voice for he was cut, passive in the sense that something has already taken place. So intensive passive would be he was slash. That word slash gives you the intensified feeling of the word to cut. And because we have he was passive refers to something that happened to the person, not what the person is doing. Okay. And that's the difference between the passive and the active. The active is always with reference to what the subject is doing, whereas with the passive, it has to do with primarily something that has happened to the subject. So and I know in sharing and communicating this, this, this is um, really information that we are that, that many of us, uh, are probably already familiar with when we deal with language, but this is uh, what is applied with respect to Hebrew that we need to be mindful of when we deal with both mood and voice working together. All right, now I want to look at causative, active. Causative, mood, the voice is active. The phrase would be, he made a cut. So, in this instance, we see something where the action is caused. And when it's active, it gives the idea of something that is happening in the sense of the present. Now, uh, causative passive, where we have causative mood and the passive voice. In this instance, he was made cut. And in this instance, it talks about something that happened in the past. But now let's look at intensive reflexive. That would be intensive mood and the reflexive voice. In this instance, the phrase would be, he slashed himself. Intensitive in the mood is seen by the use of the word slashed. Because that gives a more intensified feeling to the word cut. And then reflexive, having to do with the fact that the action is occurring to the subject, himself. 
he slash himself. So we want to be uh, mindful of those different methods in which we have the mood and the voice here together. Now, I want us to look at the nouns. Let's look at the nouns. things we want to note about the nouns here today. And we want to know that most common nouns, as we have discussed before, come from two-letter roots or three-letter roots. We talked about the different roots when we talked about the Hebrew root system, where we dealt with the parent roots, the child roots, and the adoptive roots. So when we look at the roots, out of the parent roots is where we get our verbs, and then from the verbs, we have the abstract of that concrete verb, we get our nouns. And so when we look at the nouns, let's look at the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Those two letters are the Aleph and the Bait. Now, we have provided a definition for the Aleph and the Bait. Literally, it means the strength of the house. It can also mean the support of the house in the sense of when we see the Aleph we know that the Aleph is an ox head. Here is the Aleph and the Bait. We have the Aleph being the ox head, the Bait being the tent or the house. One of the things that we need to note about this, because there, there are a variety of... Uh, definitions and words that we can derive from a parent root that basically means the same thing. Now in most instances in how we have been using the Aleph and the Bait, we have referred to the Aleph and the Bait as being Ab in the sense of Father because we know the Father is the strong one of the house or the strength of the house. But that's not the only use of the Aleph and the Bait. So what we want to do, we want to understand the, the root meaning of it. So when we look at the parent root, the parent root derives this meaning of as a noun it's a tent pole. Now, the Aleph and the Bait does not in any way give us a pictorial meaning of a tent pole. But from the abstract understanding of a strong thing, supporting the house, where, the, where it's regarded as the strength of the house or the support of the house. That's the verb action, that which supports the house or the tent, we would get the idea in the literal sense. And this is what we need to understand. In the literal sense of you have a tent that's being supported, what supports a tent? A tent pole. So we get the idea of the tent pole or the tent post from the Aleph and the Bait. So we get that meaning from Av as a noun. Okay? We also know that, um, as we have noted already, 
uh, from the Av, we get the, we get the uh, the word Father, which is also a noun, because the Father is the strength of the house. But uh, as we as we mentioned, as we've looked at this uh, previously, we want to note that all nouns are action oriented. That's important for us to be mindful of. All nouns are action oriented. So depending on the context of how you might see the Aleph and the Bay, even though we use it in most instances for father, um, it also can be used to refer to a tent pole. So if we have the word of couched within a sentence where the information is describing a tent structure or a tabernacle, say for example, a tabernacle, because you know the scriptures talk about the building of the tabernacle and the supports and how many supports are needed and all of that. Um, when we see it used in the context of a building, then you would have to derive the meaning of of to mean tent pole. You wouldn't derive the meaning of of to mean father. I hope this is making sense. So it's important that when we look at these words in Hebrew, that the word, while it may have a particular definition that we may use more oftentimes than not, the parent root meaning of it means the strength or support of the house. So that application can be made in a variety of different contexts in the scriptures. So that's important for us to understand as well. And that is that one word in the Hebrew, while it may have a specific definition in many contexts that we are accustomed to, we have to understand what that parent root meaning is. Because that parent root meaning can be applied differently in other contexts. Okay? So that's important for us to be mindful of. Especially when we use this uh, particular word right here, the ah, the olive and the bait. That's really important. Now we want to look at uh, noun derivatives. Let's look at uh, noun derivatives. And I just wanted to touch on um, that particular aspect of the noun by using that word. You know, there are many other words in Hebrew. Uh, we use the aleph and the bait, which is a two-letter parent root. We could have used a three-letter parent root, but I just wanted to show how that with that particular word, there are different meanings that are derived from the parent root, and they can be applied differently depending on the content. So uh, we're going to look at noun derivatives. Now, a noun derivative is a noun that is formed from a parent root. That's what we need to know. And, and it doesn't have to necessarily just be a parent root. It could, it could be a child root. It could be uh, an adoptive root, it, which means basically it could be a two-letter Hebrew word or a three-letter Hebrew word. Two-letter root word or three-letter root word, it could be either one of those, you can get a noun derivative. So how do you get a noun derivative? Basically what happens when you get a noun derivative, you take another letter and you place that letter either as a prefix, an infix. Infixes is where you take a letter and you put it in the middle of the root. So say you have a two-letter Hebrew word. You take another letter and you place it in between those two letters. That is an infix. And then we have the suffix, which is where you take a letter and you put it at the end of a two-letter or three-letter root word. So when you do that, what happens is you get an additional 
meaning to the word. Now, I do want to look at um, an example here. And say we have the letters, uh, the pay, the tav, and the chet. We get those out for us. Want us to see it. Bear with me for a moment. looking for the top right now. Tav in Hebrew looks like a cross. Those of you who are not familiar with what Tav looks like, looks like a cross. I don't have it. Let me check in the back. Thought I had it. Let me check. Oh, my time must have got misplaced. At any rate, here's the pay. Here's the head. Now, in between these two, we would have the top. The top would look like a cross or an X. And the three letters would form a word that would mean door. It would be pata. And the word pata literally means to open. And we get the idea from the pata, we get the, we get the word door as a noun from it. And so when we have a word like pata, that's three letters. We have pay, we have the Tav, and we have the Chet. Here's the Pei. The Tav looks like an X or a cross. And here we have the Chet. Now we have those three letters. Now if we're to throw another letter either at the front or the middle or the end, we would have a word that would be related to that three-letter root. Now, patav means to open, sort of like you open the door. And so because the root meaning is to open, as a noun, you get the word door, literally door. That's how you would use that three-letter word with the pay, the tav, and the chet, as a noun, you would call it door, because that's the thing that as an action opens. Okay, does that make sense? Now, when we use it, when we uh, get a noun derivative, just to give you an example, say we add the letter mem, the mem would be equivalent to the m. And we put the mem at the beginning of this Hebrew word. So say we have the mem, we have the pay, which is the mouth. I've showed you what that looks like, but I'm going to show you again. This is the pay, the mouth. And then we have the mem, the pay, the tav, which is a cross, and we have the chet. When we put the mem in front of it, what happens now is that the meaning changes. It's still related to the door, but the meaning that we have as a noun, when we put that mem on the front, is called maftach. And so what happens is we have a noun that's created, which means key, key. 
What does a key do? A key is used to open the door. So when we put the mem in front of the pay, the tav, and the chet, what we have is a noun derivative. We have a noun that is derived from the noun that we had before. So in this instance, we have the word patah. The word patah which is the pay, the tav, and the chet. That word as a noun means door. But then when we put the mem in front of the pay and it becomes mepata, then what we got is a word that is a derivative of door. So, the noun that's a derivative of the noun door is key. Key is associated with the door because the key opens the door. And all of it's associated with the action of to open, which is the verb of the word patach. Okay? So I trust that that's making sense. Because when we look at words in the Hebrew, the root of that Hebrew word is a verb. It's an action. And when we look at that action in the word, when it's in its verb form, when we deal with it abstractly, we get a noun from it. And the way we get our nouns is we got to think about first, what is the action? And this right here is, is a perfect example. Because when we look at the word to open, more than likely the, the, the best uh, noun or thing used that's associated with opening is a door. That makes perfect sense, a door. So this is how we get a noun derivative. And there are... Uh, a number of noun derivatives in Hebrew where we start with a verb root and then we add a Hebrew letter into this verb root and we have a noun derivative. Now, um, I want to reiterate um, something with reference to uh, masculine and feminine. I had uh, mentioned before that when we deal with the masculine and the feminine, that generally all verbs and all nouns as they are, are in the masculine. But when we present it in the feminine sense, there are some letters that we add to the word so that we may be able to understand it as being feminine, to make the distinction between male and female. So one of the things we want to note when we are dealing with this is that we need to look at the feminine by taking a word in masculine and adding a letter to it. So in most instances with many of the words that are nouns in Hebrew, if we want to make it feminine, then what we will do, we'll add a hey at the end of the word. This is what the hey looks like. And so when we need to make that distinction, or when we need to be able to know what's the difference between the masculine and the feminine, if we see the hay on the end of it, we can then know that it is in the feminine. So say, for example, if you um, look at the word for, uh, for man, uh, in the sense of male and female. You have the word ish. And for female, you have the word isha. 
on the end of that word isha, you'll see the hey. Okay? That's important for us to know. Here's one of the main ways in which you'll be able to know the difference between masculine and feminine. You look for the hey. Also on the end of many of the words that are in the feminine, you will see the ta on the end. That's the cross or X, however you want to understand it. Sometimes it's oriented like this, sometimes it's oriented like this. This is the Paleo-Hebrew that we're using. And uh, when you look at a word that has the tav on the end of it, that's another way in which you'll be able to know whether it is masculine or feminine. If you see the tav on the end, it will be in the feminine. Now, uh, we had mentioned also about uh, masculine plurals and feminine plurals, and I'm just going to reiterate this also. When you see the, uh, what's called the Yod and the, uh, the Yod and the Mim, that's a masculine, where it's the Im on the end. Like, for example, in the word Elohim, we hear that word used a lot, I use that word a lot, um, on the word Elohim, at the end of it, you have the yod and the mem. That denotes a plural masculine with the word. But now, the feminine, however, the feminine has the wav and the tav. The wav being the tempe and the tav being the cross. So the wav and the tav you pronounce it as the ot. When you see that on the end of a word, and that gives you the plural feminine. The wav and the tav gives you the plural feminine. So that's important for us to remember as well when we start looking at feminine derivatives. Well, I'm going to close on this note. Those are the things that we wanted to cover on this evening as it had to do with verbs and nouns where we are able to understand the mood and the voice of verbs, but also we're able to understand how nouns are derived from verbs and also how the noun derivatives are created from nouns. So that's very important for us to know. So I trust that this information has been helpful to each one of you today as you are studying the scriptures and the text. These details are going to help you to be able to make distinctions between verbs and nouns. It's going to help you also to be able to know the difference between the masculine and the feminine. And so with that being said, let us pray. Father, we do thank you for this time and for this opportunity to provide this teaching. We ask that you would continue to give wisdom to your disciples that we may be able to take all of the things that we are learning and put it into operation in our study so that we may be able to understand your word with clarity and with precision. We thank you, and we give your great name the praise. May you be glorified in all things, and may Zion be built up. In the mighty name of Yahshua, amen. Well, we want to thank each and every one of you who have chosen to attend this class session with us today, and we trust that you have been edified and enlightened as you have been studying in each one of our class sessions. I want to invite you to sow a seed unto the Almighty. 
your seed assist us in helping to bring the word of the Most High to the nations. It also helps us in being able to provide materials and resources for those who are not readily able to obtain those materials monetarily. And so we want to ask you to sow a seed and help us to be able to continue to do that. Our website is www.ncmmi.20m.com. You can go to that website. And you can share a donation with us by clicking on the donate button. You can also share with us by Cash App. Our Cash App code is dollar sign NCMMI. Again, we want to thank each one of you for being a part of this class session. And we hope that it has been beneficial for you. And for those of you who have not yet enrolled in School of Messiah Bible Institute, we encourage you to enroll in School of Messiah Bible Institute, become a part of the teaching and the training and grow in the way of the Creator. Your life will never be the same. It's our goal to help enrich each and every one of you and to help you to become all that the Most High has called for you to be. Well, the Most High be praised. Again, we thank you for attending with us and trust that you have been encouraged. The Most High bless each and every one of you and your families. Shalom.